I'm waiting for you. Yeah. I started streaming. Our audio is live. I'm just making sure. Yeah, I'm going to pop one now. All right. Let's go. Good? Yep. Okay, uh, which camera am I looking at? Up top or Jake? Uh, up top for now. It's a little bit blurry, but it's old. Old? Okay, there we go. Yep. Go, go? Yep. Hi, folks. Welcome to our live Purple Heart Project YouTube workshop. Got to shorten that title. And uh, I'll introduce everybody here once we get into it a little bit. Let's have first question, Frick. Oh, you didn't tell me you were going to do that. Well, I just did. Tonight's topic, by the way, as chosen by... Actually, I guess we all pitched in on it, but I didn't realize it was coming up this quick, is Restoring... Actually, what is the title? Rest restoring... Old restoring Hand Planes. Restoring Old Hand Planes. I got one. Pardon? I got one. Okay, go ahead. All right, this one comes from Colin in Virginia. Hi, hey, Colin in Virginia. And, oh, by the way, I need to uh, shout, give a shout-out right away and thank... Thank... Bear with me here. Do, 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 do. Come on. Come on. Sorry. Jerome. Jerome out in Colorado. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you starting off our donations. Such a nice, healthy gift. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Colin in Virginia, Colin wants, in Virginia. wants to know, what are your thoughts on modifying an old plane sole to accept an IBC-style blade and chip breaker? What are my thoughts of restoring modifying. an old... Modifying an old plane. Modifying... Plane. An old plane soul to soul. accept. I'm not sure why he singled out the soul. I maybe he's talking about opening up the throat to fit an IBC blade chip breaker. Well, that's uh, first of all, you got to put planes in their proper perspective. You can buy a number four or number five on eBay any day of the week for twenty five dollars. So they're uh, they're a dime a dozen or less, if it's an heirloom uh, family treasure, then that's a different story. If it's a bedrock, bedrocks were the professional line of planes that Stanley made, and you can tell a bedrock because the easiest way is they're square, frame. they're flat across the top right here. Where, Sorry. Get into frame. They're flat on that shoulder, unlike what I would call the consumer line, which are round right here. And if that doesn't give it away, the, the word bedrock written right there will. Or they put it on the lever cap too. Not on all of them, but most. So if it's simply a tool that you're wanting to learn how to plane with, then do whatever you have to do to make it work better. And the single biggest Achilles heel in these planes was the fact that they put blades in them that were so thin. Ken, have you got the uh, micrometer? Calipers. Cal calipers, calipers, sorry. Actually, you know what? No, don't bother. I've got, I, I have a micrometer right here. I can use this. These blades usually came in somewhere between 70 and 80 thousandths of an inch. So I'll just dial this in. If we measure that. That's seven, se uh, 78 thousandths of an inch. Well, that is really skinny. And if you compare it to a Wood River, uh, pardon me, an IBC, which is what his question was, this one comes in at 142 thousandths, so almost double. And those little thin blades squeal. They vibrate at a high pitch vibration when you put them into a piece of hardwood. And there's a combination of reasons why, but the single biggest one is the blade's so thin. So by putting a thick blade on it, instantly you're going to improve the performance of the plane so absolutely now i'm going to caution you i uh, i developed that chip breaker that allows you to use a big thick blade in an old stanley plane and i'll show you that tonight but i would still recommend that you you're better off going out and buying a good plane instead of spending a lot of money just on a blade and chip breaker unless it's a family heirloom and you want to preserve it or make it work then in that case, 
throw caution to the wind and just do whatever you have to do to make it better. But yeah, modify your plane, do whatever you have to, and the and the thicker blade will will be the single biggest reason or single biggest solution to making the plane work better. Rick, I'm gonna have a drink out of my aw uh, shoot mug, which was suggested by our YouTube viewers, so it's coming. Next. All right. Question. Next, next one comes from uh, Herbie Grief in Northeast England. Hey, Herbie. You're up late. He says, should plane blades be heat or cold treated in any way before sharpening? No. No, the plane should come to you ready. Actually, the plane should come to you ready with the exception of sharpening. Um, you should not be satisfied with the level of sharpening the blade is going to come. That's something that you personalize. It only comes pointed. You make it sharp. But as far as having to heat treat it, no. If there's a problem that way, you've got a defective plane that you'd return it. And I certainly wouldn't know what to do to heat treat it. I don't know how many people would. Next. All right. Next one comes from John Root in Greenbrier, Arkansas. Hi, John. He says, when should we look to replace the blade, and should the chip breaker be replaced at the same time? Um, are you talking about the wear? or the reason why to replace. Let's all dress both. I, I can't imagine, there isn't anybody in this room that's young enough to wear out a plane blade. So yeah, you'll probably never have to do that in your lifetime. Uh, I have seen some old Stanleys where <coughs> the blade edge was right down. I'll show you what I mean. So if you take this apart, you remove the chip breaker. The blade edge was right here, right at the bottom of that circle. That that probably needs to be replaced. Would I replace the chip breaker? Well, this is the old style chip breaker. It had a little curve on it, and uh, th that was in there so that when you clamp down the pressure on that screw, it was designed to only touch, the chip breaker only touches back here and right out at the cutting edge. They, that curve was there to allow the cutting edge to sit lower to sit lower than the back side of the blade. And that put pressure out on the cutting edge. So when you put these together, and I think there's far too much chatter about uh, how close it needs to be to the edge, leave it at a 32nd of an inch and just leave it there. No reason to have it any closer or any farther away. It doesn't do near what people think it does, I don't think. And now what that does is puts pressure out on the cutting edge to help stabilize that otherwise very thin blade. So when you buy a, uh, a replacement blade, particularly an IBC, that blade is thick enough that it does not need a chip breaker. However, when the way the planes are designed, this adjustment right here, Jake, the yoke, as that, the, the, the yoke's function is to push the blade out farther for a thicker shaving or retract it for a thinner shaving. And... It uh, does that by engaging the chip breaker. The chip breaker pulls the blade along with it. So if you didn't have a chip breaker, that function would be useless. You wouldn't be able to use it. So when they design these blades now, they have to have to add a chip breaker just to be able to have, make it function. Which I always like demonstrating, by the way, how you can change from one to the other so quickly. So just for the sake of uh, me having a little fun, let me let me set this up. Now what I'm going to do is that throat, the area where the shaving comes out, is set too close for what I'm about to do. So I'm going to open it up. And I'm going to sell you a couple of things tonight because if your goal is to enjoy using a hand plane, then the better your plane works, the more enjoyable it's going to be. You notice that I'm able to access those screws really easily because I have what's called an adjust star. That's something that Jake and I took how long to, what, from the time we had the idea, the time we brought it to market, was it almost, was it a well, year and a half? No, it wasn't. How long was it? Two. two years. <laughs> Nothing happens quick, right? Especially when you're involving a whole bunch of different parties and samples are going back and forth. But the, the uh, these things always had an adjuster knob. And I remember thinking, I said, that stinking thing is so hard to turn sometimes. Yes, 
that it makes it very difficult, particularly if you have uh, any arthritis, it makes it so difficult to, to adjust it. You have to have a certain amount of tension. I know I'm getting away from the question, but I'm trying to give you as much information as we can. You have to have enough tension on this thing called the lever cap to prevent this blade from moving accidentally while you're using it. But you can't have so much tension that you can't make adjustments either. So anyway, bottom line is this becomes very difficult to turn. I remember looking at that one time thinking, why don't they? I mean, I had gone in and I used to cut grooves in mine and do everything to get a little more grip, but it would always leave less than perfect. And one day we decided, we came up with the idea of using this five-spoke wheel. No, one day we bought. Jake, I lost the... Uh, what? I lost video. You lost video? Yeah, just a second. Switch camera. Personal problem. <laughs> and? You Tell can me. still talk. I, I switched to the other camera. Oh. The other way. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm focusing. Are we good? You're all right. Okay. So now we have this five-spoke wheel that allows you lots of leverage because you can push down on those paddles. And it just makes it so much easier to use. And it's a refit. So we have, right now, we have, we have ones that will fit a Wood River plane from a number five, four and a half through to the seven. And we have one that will fit because there's a different pitch on that rod. We have ones that fit Lee Nielsen's from five, four and a half to eight. And we're working on a Stanley one. So you replace that with this. Okay, do you remember the original question? The original question was, oh, just so that you can kind of see a little bit of the history. So, no, no, just give me a second here, son. So here, we, we first talked about aluminum, and we went through, and, and this one came out, the edges were a little bit too sharp, and then we went to one that was spent a little more time in the tumbler, and well, we did that several times with this one before we finally came up with something that felt right. So that's kind of the progress of how that came about. Now, the question was, <laughs> what was the question? The yeah, que we're chatting hand planes. The anyway, question I was, when should we look to replace the blade and should yes. the chip breaker be replaced at the same so, time? So, yeah, so what I was going to do was just show you what you could do. So we'll start off, we'll start off with a, a really light pass. So there's something that's coming off at about, oh, 1.2 thou, maybe, maybe even 1.3. Let's see how accurate I am tonight. We'll zero this in. So we're five, five zeros past the decimal point. Actually, this is probably going to be about 1.4. And just go until the ratchet trips. Whoa, well, I was way off. That's one, one point quarter. one and three quarter. Holy Toledo. Let's see if we can get them a little thinner. It is pine, so it, it pine doesn't uh, hold together when you get down too low. Quick question from Brandon. Do you ever plan on making the Adjustars bronze uh, to match the traditional hardware? No. No, because it has to be branded, and our brand is chrome. Uh, Super Dave would like to tell you no drinks on the bench. <laughs> is that what he said? Yeah, but it's out of my, oh, shoot. It's, okay, so that one is 0 .00085. So that's just under a thou. And then while you're planning, you can just start moving that adjuster knob and take that blade up, or uh, force that blade out. See how heavy of a cut we can take. This is if you need to remove a lot of material. You want to give us an <clears throat> well, they're they're not coming. Uh, they're not staying together. I've never seen it come off like that before. It's kind of weird. My demo's heading to the toilet real quick. Anyway, you can take lots of material off, and then you can bring that all the way back around and come back to taking a very fine shaving.
respect to that. Very versatile. So the question was, when do you want to replace it? I would replace it now, and I would replace it with something like this. So this is the modern version of a chip breaker. And the modern version doesn't have the bump. The advantage is it's, uh, it's thicker. It's easier to prepare or to tune up. It's really a pain to try to prepare these if they're not, they have to lay flat. So when you put these together, and if you look at the light, if you can see a gap anywhere along that leading edge, then there's a good chance the shavings are going to get jammed in there. It'll clog up the throat, and you have to stop and take it all apart. It's a lot easier to prepare these than it is the old ones. And I think just the thickness, and it's stiffer. So in terms of how it functions in stabilizing the blade, this will do a better job. The only downside is it looks exactly like the blade. So a lot of times people actually get that turned around. They get the blade on the top. And remember, chip breakers are a lot softer. I should say not as hard. If the blade is coming out at 60-62 Rockwell, the chip breakers, I think, are down around the mid-30 range. So if you ac accidentally turn around and put that as the cutting edge, it'll tear that all up, and even on a piece of pine, and then you got to go back and restore it. We actually had one return just recently, and that's what happened. Somebody had flipped it around. So the single biggest problem with your plane is always the blade... And if it's an old plane, just replace it with a thicker new one, and 80% of your problems will go away. Next, Frank. Okay, this, one, this one comes from Robert Griffin in the chat. Hey, Robert. He says, I fashioned two tote handles that don't work. Any advice on getting the tote bolt to line up would be appreciated. Oh, yeah. I was thinking about this just the other day because I found some that I had been working on. So what Robert's talking about is this is, this is called the handle or the rear tote, and it has, uh, I'll take it apart so you can actually see. And I'll give you some suggestions that hopefully will be helpful. So if we take this, I need that other screwdriver. So I'm going to ask the question, are you guys interested in me telling you about some things that you can buy that will make your hand planing experience more productive and more enjoyable? <coughs> Tell me if anybody says yes. I only need one. Okay. Somebody come back to me with that. So here's your handle. So the grain is running this way. And you've got a, to a toe screw right there. And if you take this apart, one of the things that you can do, actually, if you want to, if you want to improve this, is get a file... I've got some shout-outs to do tonight, too. How, how are we for numbers right now, Frick? Uh, 621. Okay. And they're saying, they're saying yes to the... Uh... Yeah, okay. So come in here. So this is the, um, the boss that the, the handle sits on. And what I found is sometimes it's not very flat. And if it isn't very flat, then when... Now, wh wh just let me back up oh, two seconds. What we're trying to do is take our plane and improve it. Sometimes it's a 1% improvement with each thing we do. Well, if I can find 10 things to improve that it gets the gains a 1%, that's a 10% improvement. That's noticeable. And what I noticed with these is that it just didn't get very good feedback through your hand. Well, it's easy enough to flatten the bottom of that off. You can do that on your shooting board. But then come in here with a file and file that boss till it comes out nice and flat. And what that'll do is just make a much closer mating surface between the bottom of the tote and this surface. So you see what I mean? It's really low up in there, so it probably wasn't making very much contact. Now, you don't need to get it perfectly smooth, the fact that it's touching all along that edge and touching there and touching all along that edge, I might take it down a little bit more until I got, I got some contact or some shiny spots on my top left-hand side. Okay, so we get contact all the way around. Now I want to fix this. So to fix that, I'm going to get out a Harold Snodgrass super duper shooting board. Right, Ken? Right. Should we announce anything about Harold? Yeah. No. 
Harold's home convalescing. He and the jointer, his jointer, I might add. A seven or eight? <laughs> a general. Remember when Dave, Super Dave was setting up his shop and you asked him what he had for a jointer? And what did he say? A number seven. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we felt bad. Harold uh, Harold had a kickback on the jointer and he broke his thumb in two places, so he's got a cast on. So we are we are desperately hoping he gets better soon. So what I'm going to do is just go in and flatten this off, so that now that sits on there and doesn't rock, nice and flat. <coughs> and if that color bothers you, you can always go in and paint it again, but. So you want that to sit nice and flat. Shouldn't However, shouldn't pardon? It shouldn't bother. No. It looks, it looks no. like a machine no. surface. Now, how do you make one of these? Well, the first thing you're going to want to do, if you look at this and you recognize that, okay, the grain is running this way, but this screw or this rod passes down through that on an, like that on an angle. So if you cut this out first and then try to drill that, well, first of all, you're going to have to mount it on your drill press, right? And you're going to either have to tilt your drill press table, but then you've got to hold this. So you're far better off to do this. Get a wider piece of wood. Well, pardon me for using MDF because I just don't have a piece of wood here, but I would uh, see if we make sense out of this. That's what I was just looking for. So my grain is running like this, right? So I'm going to have my handle like that. But what I'm going to do to get started is I'm going to I'm going to cut my piece of wood I'm going to cut my piece of wood like that. Now wait a minute here. Hold on a second. Is that what I want to do? Right. Yeah, okay. So if I cut my piece of wood like that, grain lines running like this, and I were to trace this on here, now I got to figure out the angle. So what I would do here, come in with a piece of car, uh, cardstock or something, and set that in there, ref referencing off of that boss, and then get a, li a straight line on there. And then take that over and transfer that onto here so that you can then go over to the drill press. And on the drill press, with this block sitting, sitting flat on there, you'll be able to drill your hole right down through your handle. Right? It's going to be a lot easier to do. And you can go in and you, because you've got to cut a recess there for that big round nut that sits on there. And, and it's not a bad idea either to recess. See how that hole, is, that hole is actually drilled larger diameter than this so that it doesn't have to line up perfectly in order to make it into that hole. And then once you've done that, you can, you can cut this. This one can be done after the fact because it's, uh, it's a straight cut down through there. It's not on an angle. And line those two up, and then when it comes to shaping it, you know what? That's just a. I I made a uh, I made a jig for holding this because I don't want like using a small piece like that on a router, especially when you're taking the entire edge off, or in this case, you're taking half of it off because you're using a quarter round bit, and then you got to flip it over, and you're always going to be either going against the grain or with the grain, and you can't change that because the router bit only spir spins in one direction. And it's just, it's just really nasty when you're getting down in here. So if you're only making one, you'd be far better off to invest in a couple of rasps and go in there and shape it all with a rasp. And then you don't have to worry about cutting your fingers off on a router. And of course, you've got to come in and sand and do all the rest of that in order to get a good finish on there. This top side can be done on the edge of a belt sander or a disc sander, but... It's just a bit of a thing to do, but that's probably the best tip I can give you is to keep it in the square, get the holes drilled before you cut it out to shape. 
hope that helps. Now, here's something you, everybody should buy. Ken, would you go grab a handful of, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, We're on the same, no. Yeah. yeah. So all planes, with very few exceptions, use brass screws. There's a brass screw. These are brass screws. This one, this one. And it doesn't take much. If you look at a regular screwdriver, have we got a regular screwdriver, Jake? Because I don't have one here. A regular screwdriver, Moose, do me a favor, in that orange, in that red cabinet back there, the big drawer in the middle has full of screwdrivers. Moose can do. All right. So a regular screw, where am I looking now? Up here, Frick? Yep. A regular screwdriver has a taper that comes to the tip. So when you put that screw into that, into that slot, it's really only making contact on the top edge. Thank you, Ken. Oh, that was another good idea. Thank you. You could have grabbed some adjusters too, I guess. Grab a couple of them if you would. I'm uh, sorry, I should have told you. So you put the screw in there. It's only making contact on the top lip, and it doesn't take any time. In fact, I guarantee if you have a plane, you have a plane where that is all buggered up on the top. Here. So what we did, thank you. So there you go. I need you, I need you, because I gotta have the camera in close. While you're doing that, I'll put this back together. And by the way, when you put this in, you'll find it's usually easier. I did this in reverse. It's usually easier to get this one started first. Don't tighten it up because it'll still give you a little bit of wiggle room. Then put the toe screw in. And by the way, number fours usually don't have a toe screw. Then you can snug that up. Remember, and then get this top one. Okay, so here's the difference. There's a regular screwdriver. It tapers. So when you put that into the screw, your only part you're actually contacting is up on the top lip. So we take these, and these are... Uh, gunsmith gunsmith screwdriver and we make them so that there is no taper on that last little bit so you have good contact especially in that brass screw and then because old hands have a hard time getting a hold of something like that we tape it like a hockey stick and that's how we sell them just like that they're all ready to go so much easier i just keep that in my shop apron and it's always there okay next question frick all right, <clears throat> comes from Charles McBride. Hi, Charles. Where is, is he? Uh, doesn't he's in the chat? He's in the chat. Yeah, doesn't say where they're from unless yeah. he says it. But oh, anyway. right, right, right. He says, "Hey, Rob, I've heard you talk a lot about plane chatter. I own both Lee Nielsen and multiple vintage planes, but I haven't experienced this. Can you demonstrate what you're talking about?" No. <laughs> um. Well, I can't. Yes, I can actually. So plain chatter is when the blade vibrates because it's either too thin, unsupported, or some combination of those two. So here's a uh, what, what an Amazon Basics. We did a we, we did a YouTube video that's coming out this week on that particular plane. Now I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a good example. I'm looking for a piece of maple, Jake. Oh, I just cut a piece. Ken, there's one in the bin. Grab that for me if you would. It's kind of small. How small is how short? It's not short. It's oh, narrow. Um, Ken? Mm -hmm. uh, never mind. I'll use this piece of cherry. So here's a piece of cherry. We've got that. Uh, this is already prepped. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I want you to listen to the sound. How good? If, can I put my microphone down here? Would it be better? Huh? You'll be able to hear it, I'm sure. Give me. I'll put it, I'll put it. Where, where's okay? There's another plane. Okay, so I'm going. To, I'm going to compare the sound of two planes, a Wood River five and a half, cutting through a piece of cherry. Now, I'm going to put some plane wax on. That would be magic wax. That's the other thing, by the way. If you want something that will really make a difference in the way that plane slides over the piece of wood. 
Okay. Let me take a half a dozen passes so you can hear it. Are they picking that up there? All right, now I'm going to take this Amazon Basics. Oh, can't forget the magic wax. Yeah, make it fair at least. <laughs> I can't tell the difference, honestly. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so approximately the same size shaving, but this is the, here's the problem. Take this off, little wee thin blade, terrible chip breaker by the way. Oh yeah, I guess we can't spoil the video. Watch the video when it comes out and you'll see a little more about it. But that's, ch so chatter, if I can show that. Well, I, you, I can't show it to you, I can only feel it. If I run my fingers right over there, Typically what it would look like if I was on a piece of maple might have shown better whole bunch of little wee tiny ripple marks And it's just that vibrating of the plane iron as it's going over the wood so it doesn't leave a very smooth surface The noise should be enough to drive you crazy Next all right Joseph in Linden, Michigan. Hey Joseph says can one be more aggressive with rust rem rust removal if the plane is designated a user plane versus a collector's item Well, Ken would you want to grab me a uh Sorry, a green hand block. I'm going to come back to that question, come back to that question while Ken's out there doing that. <clears throat> what? Luther wants everyone to, to take their, to take their uh, attention and focus it on the customer gallery. Oh, the yeah. So Luther's been working on this for 18 years, <laughs> 18 years. So we now have a new feature. Listen up, guys on our website and it's a customer gallery. See, we used to do all of our business face to face. I would go to the wood show and after the first three or four years, I knew all these customers and we'd come back and chat to see them once or twice a year. That went away and uh, for a while, our business all was done over the phone. So you'd get to talk to them and then the internet came in and all of a sudden everything is impersonal. So this is an opportunity for us to see what you're doing. And I, when I call customers, I always say, I said, send me a picture of your first dovetail. I'd love to see what actually happens out there in, in uh, Woodland. Thanks, Ken. So, how, what's the procedure? Go to our website. No, no, how do they get something on? They go to our website. So go to the website, robcosman.com. On the far right tab, it's something like other That's the one with the R, far right tab. It's like other stuff or other things, it's a weird term. Drop down menu. They can't hear you. They can't hear you? No, the mic doesn't work this week either. Mm. Well, I'm, it picks it up on here. Get mad at it, Jake. That'll, that'll change it. <laughs> how, I don't understand how it's not picking It's right there. Rick, come on. Is there a... a second. Look, what, are, what do these buttons do? Both lines. Look at the lines. I know, but you're not outputting that. That's oh, bad. Jake. Ah, shoot. <laughs> no. So you go... Can you hear me now? So go to the website, far right side, drop down menu, it says other. No, it says customer gallery. It says customer gallery. And you can go in there and you can look at stuff that people submitted. Now, if you'd like to have your work on there, what you need to do is. It says it right there. Oh, it tells them? Yeah, oh, okay, it's all self-explanatory. He must have developed, put that on since I've seen it. And then you, you, you can put your work on there and everybody will see it. Maybe you'll get orders. That's, uh, actually, that's great. I, uh, I'm glad we finally got that because uh, that's a long time coming. Next, Oh, so back to the question on being aggressive and cleaning up an old plane. Uh, the best thing that we have found, I'm just looking to see if I've got one that's really bad. Well, here's a, here's a, uh, a bedrock, number seven. So you see that side? It's not, well, it is rust. If you take one of these hand blocks... So that's how they come. How much do these cost? They're not much. Five bucks? Four dollars. Four dollars. So this is made by a company called Klingspor, called Sandflex. There's three colors. No, it's called Sandflex. Is that Luther's interpretation? <laughs> For everyone else, it's Sandflex. Sandflex. 
<laughs> we shouldn't be laughing at his expense, but we will. <laughs> so there's yellow, red, and green. The green is the one you want. Yellow is fine. Red is coarse. Green is medium. And green seems to best match the, uh, the grind that you find on planes and, and uh, saws. So if you take an area like that. Is that a green? This is, I don't know. Probably not. Oh, you think? Well, I better use the green then. So the nice thing about them is it's not something on the surface. Oh, we're kind of low. We'll be even lower after tonight. So Ken's going to bring one, and I'm going to show you. But the nice thing is the abrasive the, uh, that's, that does the work is not sitting on the surface. It's all the way through. So even when you wear it down to that size, it continues to work. So I'll just take a little area right here. A little bit of elbow grease. And that'll look like new. You see that? The best thing I have found for cleaning up old planes. So if you're try into restoring, grab one or two or ten of those. They actually last quite a long time. I mean, I know we've worn them out because we use them quite, a, quite often. But they, uh, you'll get a, you'll get a couple of planes out of it. Okay, next. Okay, next one comes from Jim Bach in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hi, Jim. Grand, been to Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids has a, a woodcraft store that was one of the top stores in the entire franchise. Okay, well, mar well merchandised store. He says, I bought a used plane, and the blade is chipping easily. I'm assuming the prior owner overheated the blade while sharpening. Can the blade be heat treated again, or should I just buy a new blade? Uh, I don't know what brand it is, but you can buy a Wood River replacement blade for $20, $25. How much, how much effort do you want to put into saving a blade? You go and buy one for $25, buy it. Um, now, having said that, let me tell you something that we've discovered, and I discovered I, this happened with Lee Nelson, it happened with Wood River, it may have even happened with IBC, so it's, it can be common. When they do the final grind, and they're grinding the back of the blade, even though they're flooding it with coolant, sometimes the back of the blade... Oh, I need a blade. Me too, for you. Right here. So... And I hope I'm getting this right, but they, I, I believe they do, they do most of the bevel before it's tempered because it's a lot easier to grind away. So when they do the final grind on the back of the blade and they're getting out here near the end, there's no metal there. So it's, if, you can, if you can imagine grinding in this area, there's quite a bit of material there to dissipate the heat. But as you get out here toward the edge and there's just nothing, it quite often burns that, with the, even though it's flooded in coolant. And what will happen is you'll sharpen, and Ken, how many times have you come, Ken does this, how many times have you come across a blade that just would not hold an edge? Many. Well, yeah, probably. How many out of ten? A couple. Maybe one out of ten. One out of ten? And all you have to do to fix it is grind back, oh, sixty-fourth of an inch? Not very much. Just kind of grind back, get away from that soft metal, and you get right back into the hard stuff. And uh, Bob's your uncle. Everything works great. So don't despair if a brand new blade's not holding an edge. That's probably what has happened. Just and by the way, when I do that, come over here, Jake, please. If you do this, if I oh, wait a minute, now I grabbed the wrong one. If I'm trying to uh, eliminate. The problem I just mentioned, I've got to, now I'm actually going to give you three examples. Number one, the temper's been removed from the very edge of the blade and it's not holding an edge. Number two, I've knocked off a corner, I've got a big nick in there. And number three, after multiple sharpenings, that's no longer square and i got to bring it back to being square. If I try to square it up by grinding it, matching that 25 degree bevel, I'm dealing with a very fine edge that again is easy to burn. So you're far better off to adjust your 
Wolverine grinding jig that you can find on our website, and it will convert an inexpensive grinder into a great grinder. You'll also notice that I'm using the CBN wheel that Jake designed with the company that makes them, that has abrasive on three sides. Cuts. This will this will be the single biggest difference you'll ever notice in a bench grinder. I would hold the have the tool rest so that it's square to the wheel, and I would literally go in and I would reshape the edge, whether it be removing a neck, squaring it, or getting rid of soft metal. Do it like this, and then replace your tool rest back to 25 degrees, move it into position, and grind the bevel back until it comes back to being a point. That is so much safer and faster than trying to do it like that through the whole way. You'll just make the you'll just have the problem continue itself. Okay. Next. All right. Next question comes from the chat. It comes from Alexis in France. Hi, Alexis. Uh, ça va? <laughs> Comment ça va? No, it's just a friend. It's ça va. That just means you good. Hey, most. Take the woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm in France, and I find the old, the old Stanley made in USA are better compared to the Stanley made in England. Can you explain that? Ask an Englishman. Uh, no, can't. Um, all I can do is give you an observation. Uh, planes, prior to Lee Nelson in 1981, planes were essentially design, uh, tools that you use to remove uh, remove shape wood. The finishing part of wood was done with sandpaper, scrapers. When Lee Nelson came in, he took old Stanley planes, he, improved, he made them out of better materials, and he tightened the tolerances. And what that did is it moved a plane from just a shaping tool to a finishing tool. I can get a finish on this piece of cherry Just get the grit off of there from the uh, little wax on the sole. Are they on special, Jake? What? The uh, plain wax. Now, I always have to thank Kevin Burris, who introduced us to this, but I think there's a two for 15, one, one for 10. Yeah. All right, so I'm in here taking a pass off of this piece of cherry. And I'm going to take it over to Moose. It could actually be improved, but what I want you to do is just feel that surface and tell me how it feels. Room for improvement? A bit. Yeah? That wasn't what he was supposed to say. You need more experience playing. <laughs> yeah. I got a little bit of a nick right there, and I can feel it. Hoping, I was hoping he was going to say, no, Rob, that's as smooth as it can get. Well, you can get that He's surface good. better. He's got soft hands. He does. <laughs> you see him out on the ice. Talented hands. You can get that surface better than you can get it with sandpaper. What was the question? That should be the theme. Somebody in the UK said that the sand Oh, like why, why are the Americans standing? Oh, 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 yeah. What's that, Ken? Somebody in the UK just said in the comments, the sand blocks in the UK are 12 pounds each. Are you serious? We got them in stock. So Stanley, Stanley's standard of bench plane manufacturing was, was not um, precision-based. And as a result, um, I sometimes think they actually use bits and pieces from wherever and put planes together. But because it wasn't precision based, they were they did the job of removing wood, but they weren't something that you could spend a lot of time tuning up and making it a, a very precise instrument. Now, David Charlesworth could argue that point, but the problem is for the average person who is just learning this, you don't you need to be on the other end to have the skill required to get it where you want it when you're at a stage where you're just beginning. So it's kind of a catch-22. So um, I just, 
I've never found a Stanley plane that I was impressed with out of the box, so to speak. Whereas today, plane manufacturers are catering to a much, a much more demanding audience that are expecting these things to come ready to be used. Somebody wants to know what's your favorite vintage plane? Oh, I was going to show you some planes that I have. My favorite vintage plane? Oh, it would probably be this one. I have a lot of kids, so we, we tend to collect small, noisy things. A little bit more. Oh, well, Jake, get back over here. Why not? Because I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> You're working? <laughs> so can you see that? This is a number one. It's a little out of focus, but... Is it they, a little out of focus? They get the idea. Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'll just give you the dimensions. The blade on it is an inch and a quarter w the wide. The plane is five and three quarter inches long. The whole thing is an inch and nine sixteenths wide. And uh, it's fully functional. Doesn't have a lateral adjustment lever. They never did. But it has an adjuster knob, lever cap. Can't see it. Can't see it? I'll zoom out. Oh. There we go. So take your blade and chip breaker off. It's a cute little thing. There's your frog. Again, no, they never had a, they never had a lateral adjustment lever. They do have a yoke, so you can uh, advance and retract the blade. Back in. There's your little lever cap. And I, I just think that's a cute little thing. It actually has um, Brazilian rosewood tote and front knob, and they go for about a thousand. Actually, I think they're closer to two thousand dollars now. So if you can find one, pick it up. So that's my, that would be my favorite vintage plane. Actually, and, and a close second would be this one, which is the number two. Bigger cousin to the number one. Now, they actually made this in a bedrock. This one isn't, but this, this is of the vintage where they were still using Brazilian rosewood for the handles. And that's just a, that one does have a lateral adjustment lever. The blade, I think, is inch and three-eighths. There's your frog. Well-made plane. Now, my, my, uh, my front knob has got some pieces missing on there, but that's all right. I don't use it. This was Jake's plane when he was last year. <laughs> Teens. So that would be my favorite. Eh, I like them all. Those ones are just, they add cute to, uh, to cool planes. Next question. All right. This question comes from the chat. It comes from uh, Mick McGuire in Toonbridge, Vermont. Hi, Mick. And, uh, Beautiful he, state. He says, another plane manufacturer, which will be left unnamed, offers three different types of steel, A201 and PM-V11. Can you speak to the differences or have opinions on which to buy for an aftermarket upgrade? Well, I have to ignore that question, that part of that question, and I'm just going to tell you what I think about blades in general. Some people don't like them. There's tough stuff being talked about. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about Lee Nielsen's blades. I'm gonna talk to you about IBC blades. I'll just talk to those two. You would have to be a metallurgist with some expensive equipment to be able to tell or notice any difference between the two. As far as I'm concerned, from a user perspective, I, and can you tell me, uh, you tell me if your experience is any different, that they, they all sharpen just as easily. When I hear people say they're easier to sharpen, I think, what are they talking about? It takes us 32 seconds to sharpen a blade, and I've never had a blade that took more than 32 seconds or less than 32 seconds. And if it did, you're talking about one or two seconds. So that, uh, that argument is completely out the window. You can sharpen a plane blade in less than a minute. How long do they hold an edge? Well, um, I think the Wood River blades hold an edge well. The IBC might hold a little bit longer. It's up to you to determine if you're willing to spend the extra money to get them. Certainly the IBC blades are presented better, but how much does that count for in the actual performance of the tool? <clears throat> so I think there's uh, an awful lot of uh, almost propaganda about one blade versus another. I think more importantly would be the thickness of the blade. A little thin blade in any plane 
is going to be the Achilles heel because it'll vibrate. Thick blades are a big plus. Are they any easier to sharpen? No, if you, if you, learn, if you learn Charlesworth ruler trick and if you learn what I do with the tertiary bevel, then all your sharpening is going to be done very quickly. It won't even be an issue. Get good stones. We sell, we sell the Shapton gear and the Trend diamond plate. And if you look at my system on any of the videos that we've done, if you follow my procedure with those tools, you will be able to sharpen freehand in under a minute. And it's all about convenience and results. I don't care what the product costs. If, if I can get great results quickly, that's where I am. I don't want to have to spend 15 minutes sharpening a blade, and I don't want to be dissatisfied with the end result. So come up with a stone that will do that, and I will buy it. I don't care what the cost is. And that's what we found with both the Shapton and the Trend Diamond Plate. So um, I'm going to throw this into the mix, although it doesn't really fit the question, but maybe it does. Ken, how many times have we dealt with somebody who said the plane wasn't working for whatever numerous reasons, and how many times is it the sharpening, their sharpening? 100%. 100% of the time. So every time somebody calls and they're trying to explain to me over the phone, Rob, this plane's not doing this, this, and that, I'm thinking in my mind, I said, how many times have I seen this? I used to travel. I used to travel and teach. Well, I used to travel enough that I'd wake up in hotel rooms and I wouldn't have a clue where I was. There was a time when I would go to three different woodcraft stores in a month. So I'd leave on a Wednesday or Thursday, go and teach two or three days of classes, fly home Sunday night, spend one or two days trying to get caught up and leave and go do it again somewhere else. So I was exposed to an awful lot of what I would call beginning, beginner woodworkers, and I never met anybody that knew how to properly sharpen. And David Charlesworth backed me up one time. I was doing a lecture, doing a presentation in a place called Westernburt, which is about an hour and a half west of London, England. And David was coming on right after me. And I had made the comment, I said, in all the teaching that I have done, I have yet to have a student show up with a properly, pro properly sharpened plane or chisel blade. Chisel. And David put his hand up and he said, Rob, I've been teaching professionally since the mid-70s. And he said, I've only seen it twice. And it really caused me to pause because what do we do? We shape wood with sharp metal tools. What must we know how to do? Sharpen those metal tools. Now, it's gotten a lot better. Because there's a lot of people now that are, have you, I mean, YouTube has made it so that you can learn anything you need. And the materials have improved. And the technique is getting out there. Charlesworth ruler trick probably accounts for, for, is probably responsible for the improvement in sharpening beyond anything else. That one technique cuts all the time and prep work out of the blame blade. And it just makes it so that anybody can do this. So kudos to David. And um, adding in the secondary tertiary bevel speeds up the bevel side of it. So it's almost always a sharpening issue. If you're having problems with your plane or blade, revisit your sharpening. I have one, a video called 32 Seconds to Sharp. If Luther can put a link in there, he will. And you go in and watch that, and you'll just say, wow, this really is simple. It's not hard at all. Next question, Frick. Do you have anything to mention or what we're giving away yep. or anything? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so the way we do this, excuse me, uh, the purpose of doing this initially was to help us, not to help us, to give people an opportunity to participate with our Purple Heart Project. The PHP, we call it, is where we bring combat wounded veterans in six times a year for a six-day, very intense hand tool workshop. We bring them in at our expense. We cover airfare, hotel, meals. Uh, we run the class from 7, 7.30 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. We feed them all the, th the three meals here. We send each vet home with somewhere between three and $3,500 worth of tools. And now thanks to, uh, to Jack Lane and Ch Chris Chahusky, we make sure that every vet gets a bench, like the benches you see that we use, delivered to their home so they can continue to do this. Of course, it's an expensive venture, but who cares? It's important. And if you're sitting on the other side of the world and you can't be here to help us teach, well, there's a way you can help. You can sponsor one of these vets or you can contribute so that we can use that money for covering any of those expenses that I mentioned. So what we do is during this live broadcast, if you want to donate, go ahead. It's on our website. Use our website, please, because 
that's the that's the least expensive way of getting the money to PHP. The only thing we end up having to pay is just the uh, processing fee of two or three percent to the credit card company. So for every thousand dollar increment that we raise, we give away a prize in addition to a few others. So over here, we, we, we get back on. So this is Moose. Moose has been a friend of mine for a long time. And Jake's too, sometimes, depending on what team he's on. <laughs> and Moose has a, a business in the city market. If you're ever in St. John, you always want to visit the city market. It's the oldest still operating farmer's market in the country. It's an upside down ship, pretty interesting place. <laughs> on a hill, so you see Moose, he stands like this all day long, so we, he's a little crooked, no pun. <laughs> Just pun. Anyway, good for a businessman. so Moose donates uh, some stuff to us so that we can have some prize to give away. And what's become famous around the world, right, and uh, is the dead cat sweater. It's actually called the cozy fleece, and we have, but uh, Frick named it because Moose had said one day that you hold this, it's like holding a fluffy cat, and somehow Frick morphed that into a dead cat. So it's known as a dead cat sweater, affectionately for all you cat lovers. And uh, he recently had a friend that designed the, uh, or, or I guess we already had the design, but he took care of getting the logo made so we could have the Purple Heart logo on there. And we give away three of these every night. So we'll do a draw for three dead cat sweaters. Thank you to Moose. If you don't get one, I always have to say this because whenever I put this on, it's like being hugged by someone you actually like. It's, uh, it is the lightest and the warmest garment that you will ever wear. Uh, uh, Chris, um, Chris Davenport, a friend of ours, actually the guy that is helping us produce our saw handles, Chris texted me after he bought one for himself and his brother, and he said, he goes, there's got to be a heater in this thing because it is so warm. So if you have a wife in particular that's always cold, buy her one of these. She'll love you forever. So and those tonight, are available on Pat's Secret Garden. Yeah, patsecretgarden.com. If you have to buy your own, you didn't get lucky enough to, to get one. But who did who did you say Moose just recently bought their fifth or fourth? Yeah. <clears throat> I just got an email from uh, Brandon. Uh, I hope I'm not butchering your name, Brandon, because you said you'd be watching. But it's Padani. Where is he? Uh, Chicago. He, he's in Westerville, Ohio, and. Uh, he just got his fifth Purple Heart dead cat. He had ordered one before, and I think uh, That's the one his wife else snagged got hold it? of it before he did, and uh, so he had to outfit the family. So he's, I think he's the, the leading owner of a cat herd now. <laughs> in the and you know what it's like to herd cats. <laughs> so shout out to Brandon. Thanks. Yeah, every, uh, we, we get more feedback. We don't sell the moose does. PatSecretGarden.com. We get more feedback from people about the dead cats and how fantastic they are, <laughs> especially the people that win them. So, great. Anyway, so tonight we're giving away three dead cats. You just tell us the size you want. Comes in small, medium, large, extra large, double extra large, and triple extra large. Um, we have some requests for uh, quadruple extra large, too, if that's ever a possibility. Yeah, Moose has... Moose has... No. Qu what? Four size? X? Four, four, four XL. Four, what are you going to put? One yeah. sweater over the entire yeah, our family? Our supplier doesn't... Doesn't do that? Doesn't have them, so. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All right. You have to each get your own. T-shirts. T-shirts, uh, yes. Oh, I got lots of stuff to talk about. So um, bring me back to that, and I'll get back to a couple of questions. So the prizes tonight, at every $1,000, we're going to give away a, uh, a Wood River Low Angle Block Plane. Ken will dress it up for you. And uh, our grand prize tonight, if we get, we're already over 2000 so we'll do it, is going to be a number six Wood River that's already been, oh, this one has, but it'll be all dressed up, so it'll be ready to go out of the box, and it'll work just like mine even better. So that's the prizes for tonight. I'll come back, and I'm going to introduce you to Angie and tell you about the uh, Purple Heart jerseys as well. Question, Frick. All right, comes from the Murray Woodcraft account. Hey, Murray Woodcraft. Uh, it says, any tips for repairing the throat on a vintage wooden joint or plane? I think it was reflattened too many times. It was my grandfather's, and I enjoy using it, but it needs some TLC. Well, actually, I remember, I think in fine woodworking, well, this is going way back into the 80s, where somebody had an issue like that. They wanted to be able to close the throat. 
So on a wooden plane, uh, you don't have the option of just going in and closing the throat. So what you can do, I thought I had a wooden plane right here, but uh, actually I do. Can't reach that. Well, there's one up. No, no, I want, I want this one. I used to, uh, I used to make oh, that, a blade that iron come down on my head. Is what? So this is a this is a, a a wooden plane that I used to make them and I used to teach a class making them. They work really nice. Only problem is that it's wood, so it moves. So, in order to close the throat down, what you can do is go in and literally remove. You do it with a router, even a router plane. Remove a chunk of wood out of there, and then bring it over to. Or actually, I would probably bring it all the way over, and then after the glue's dried, flush it off, and then you can go in with a file, and you can just ease it back until you get it exactly where you want. But so you're just going to cut out a section right out of here, and set it in, glue it in place, flush it up afterwards, and then you can redo it to whatever throat adjustment you want. It's actually not that hard. Okay, next. All right, comes from Roderick Butler. He says, are there any vintage planes that Rob thinks functions just as well as modern? Maybe an infill shoulder router or, bull, or bullnose. Well, here, now it's time to show off some of my planes. So if you look at this, here's a Norris. So these were called infill planes. And uh, they would stuff this wooden, this metal body with wood, and they're really heavy, and it has what's called a York pitch. So whereas a normal plane is, the blade is held at, actually, I just lied to you, that's, that's, uh, that's not a York pitch. This one is. This is a 45 degree pitch. This blade is held at uh, 55, might even be, I think it's 55. So this one is not, I thought this was and it isn't. So this, uh, this has a really tight throat, extremely tight. I bought this, I think I paid $1,000 for this long time ago, just because I thought it was cool. I never use it. So the question was, is there any plane, a vintage plane that I think is as good as a modern, a modern plane? Well, uh, these could be made to be. But anytime there's wood, I mean, that the frog is wood, so it's always going to be moving. So you're never going to have the advantage of a metal body plane, which doesn't move with seasonal changes in humidity. This is one of Ron Breeze's planes. I met Ron when I was teaching down in Atlanta one time. Beautiful plane. This is also an infill with some mother of pearl inlay. Blades a quarter of an inch thick. Now, the only disadvantage of this is that there's no forward advance adjustment. There's no lateral adjustment. So what you do is you put enough pressure on the lever cap. And by the way, no chip breakers on these. And they work just as well. And then just take a brass hammer and you tap it one way or the other. So it's a bit finicky. It's not the plane that I would use to go in as my general purpose. It was one that you might set up so it's just for a finishing pass. But you know what? I can do that with the Wood River, so that's why this more or less just sits there and looks pretty. And there's another Ron Breeze infill, which is a really nice plane. This, too, is a, a very high-pitched blade. This is one that Conrad Sawyer made. I bought from him. Conrad's a Canadian plane maker up in Ontario. Beautiful plane. His, his uh, sides and soles are all dovetailed together. Isn't that cool? They peen that, which is the malleability of, of bronze or brass, whatever it is. I think it's bronze. And the body is made out of yew, which he had salvaged off of some other, I think it was another plane. That was a $2,000 plane, by the way. So there's lots out there. I mean, I, I don't collect them, but if I see a nice one, I'll pick it up just because I like the history behind you it. You don't collect them. Huh? You don't collect them? <laughs> no, well, not really. I have all of these because we did a video called the Great... Oh, hey, would you grab me one of those? Great what? Hand Plane Revival video? Yeah. Please can. Uh, we did a video way back in 2008, I think, and it was on how to restore an old plane. And uh, 
in the process of doing it, I had to get some quick experience on on doing them, making them. So, how many did we buy, Jake? I wasn't involved in the purchasing. Time. You weren't. I'm surprised. Mm-hmm. You usually do a good job at spending I money. I bought a hundred planes over a six seven month period, and I restored most of them. So I could I wanted to see how much variation there was going to be in one plane from one Stanley plane to another, and they're really. It was just uh, none of them were precise instruments, so you could pretty much say something, and it would almost apply to all of them. Thank you. So that's the video. If you if you want, uh, it covers the entire process of taking a plane and going through and correcting everything. In fact, if you follow what's in there, you can get Lee Nielsen performance out of an old Stanley. The problem is you don't have the adjustment f- finesse with a modern plane off the, that you do, uh, you don't have it, you don't have the finesse, adjusting finesse on the old plane like you do on the newer planes. I, I tell people, look, you've got two options as far as I'm concerned. If money's not an issue, go buy Lee Nelson. They make the best planes. If you'd rather save a few dollars but you still want the performance, you buy a Wood River. It's patterned after the original Stanley Bedrock just like the Lee Nelsons are. It has all of the features you want, it just doesn't have the spit polish that you get on a Lee Nelson. It doesn't change how it performs, it just changes a little bit how it looks. Most relaxing thing to do in the shop. I could do this all night, but you wouldn't get any more questions answered, so <laughs> I'll stop. Go ahead, Frick, next. All right. Uh, Jason Brown in California says, Hi, Jason. what specialty planes would you recommend for a refurbishment candidate? What specialty planes would you would recommend I... for a refurbishment recommend. candidates? So you want to refurb instead of buying new. Well. Yeah, we say specialty planes. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going away from the bench planes? I assume he's asking about planes that you can't readily buy. Yeah. Well, let's just look at my tool cabinet, and then I'll, and then I'll just recommend the replacement or the uh, the antique version of. So as I look through here, of course the five and a half or the six get used the most. Um, scrub plane, you can still you can still fairly easily grab a, a Stanley forty and a half. So Stanley made two scrub planes, a forty and a forty and a half. And the 40 is really small, almost fits a kid, whereas the 40 and a half is the, is the adult version. It's got a wider blade, larger tote, a little bit wider body. So I would, su- I would suggest that would be one. Um, a scraper plane, this is called the 112. And Stanley made that version. Coons made one. And, uh, of course, Lee Nielsen makes one. So you might want to pick up one of those. You're going to start, now you're entering into a, a realm of collect, you're competing with collectors. And you're going to start paying as much for that maybe as you might almost a Lee Nelson. So you kind of have to be aware of that. I would buy this before I would buy the Stanley. So do so, do whatever you want. This is the number 85. This one has tilting handles. So the handles, you can loosen the screw and the handles will tilt to the right or to the left. It, the blade goes all the way to both sides, so it allows you to work into a vertical corner. I wouldn't call it a necessity, but if you could grab this, but you're gonna, you are going to pay more for a Stanley 85 than you would for a new Lee Nielsen, except you probably can't get the Lee Nielsen's right now. Huh? Oh, yeah, I walked by this. The 10 and a quarter. This is, um, this is one plane that I wouldn't want to part with. We don't use it a lot, but when you, you need to use it, this is the plane you have to use, particularly in drawer making, if you've got to go in and fix the interior. Blade goes all the way to both sides, has tilting handles so that you can work. And by tilting, let me just show you so you'll understand the purpose. So if you loosen that, tilt it over like this, snug it up again. Same thing with the front knob. Now, when you're planing into a vertical surface, so I'm, uh, I'm, for whatever reason, I'm having to work it up a vertical surface. I don't want to bust my knuckles, but I can get right into that corner. You can't do that with a bench plane because your blade stops shy on both sides. 
So if you could find a 10 and a quarter, but that's another plane that you'll pay more for a uh, for the Stanley than you would for a new Lee Nielsen. But yes, I would that. The other one I was going to say right away is a, a router plane. Whether it's the small one or the large one, you definitely want to have a router plane. They're just a extremely precise tool. The Lee Nielsen version is somewhere around uh, 75 or $80. And I think he did the best job because... This is really uh, critical. Wait till I pull out my adjustment screwdriver with the great grip. When Tom made this, he uh, he cut a a square hole down through the frame, down through the body, and this adjustment screw pushes on this corner, so it drives. Th and by the way, this was the weak. This was the weak link in the Stanley version. It drives it back into that corner, so it's tightening it against this wall and that wall. And it's just a very positive system. Some have round shafts, which are easy to manufacture, but the blade hits something and it moves because you can't tighten it as much as you can this. This is a great design. Kudos to Lee Nelson. This is the larger version. Stanley still makes that. But again, their blade, blade holding mechanism was not very good. You'd hit something hard and the whole thing would go flying apart and pieces would go all over. Same thing. Lee Nelson cut a square hole down through there, tightened it on a net, pushing on that corner, driving it into the opposite corner. Much, much better design. So I definitely would put that in my arsenal. I would want a small chisel plane. There's times when you're having to get right into a vertical surface, but not, not like I was showing you with the 10 and a quarter, but where you're having to come up in, into something like this. And that's a, that's a valuable tool. They, they made it in two versions, the 97 and the 97 and a half. The 97 and a half is the small one. I prefer the small one over the larger one. Hmm? Oh, Lee Nelson. Yeah, but Stanley made it too. So I would, I would buy that. Hello, Megan. Um, now that's, are we going to call that a plane? This is a, uh, this is another scraper. This is a Stanley number 80. And there, you can still get these quite, quite easily. So instead of having to hold a scraper blade, which is not terribly precise, your thumbs burn because they get really hot. This does a great job of supporting it and making it a lot easier. You can deflect a little bit by turning that thumb screw, which will change the shape a little bit to allow it to dig in more in one area. So if you're going in and spot uh, repairing, plus you also have a bit of sole in order to hold it and give some reference. Whereas with a, if you're just holding a scraper blade, you don't have any reference, so you can easily start to do wavy stuff, whereas that will, will prevent it. So that's... I would definitely want to suggest you get a number eight if you can find one. Uh, I'm not going to talk about spoke shapes. We're not going to include that. I've got a, an edge plane in there, but you know what? I can live without that. So if you were just saying kind of at a bare minimum, I, uh, a shoulder plane, if you want to call that a specialty plane, that's another, that's another essential. Uh, I would suggest if you're going to buy a shoulder plane, get something in the three-quarter inch range. Advantage of a shoulder plane, blade goes to both edges, allows you to go in and work to a vertical surface, particularly good for doing the shoulder on a tenon. And if, if you want, get yourself good saws and learn how to saw accurately, and you may never have to use this, but that would need to be in your arsenal. And I'll say the last one would be a skew block plane. Lee Nielsen makes this, and uh, this really, you can't buy the original as good because the original never had a fence. Lee Nelson added the fence to it, which made a huge difference. The original, you simply had a removable side plate like you do here. The blade was exposed on the side, allowed you to work into the uh, vertical surface. But because the blade is skewed, if you're cutting across the grain, it gives you a very nice cut. The Lee Nelson version now has, not only do they have a fence, but they also have a little cutter right here. And that cutter, scores the wood ahead of the blade so you get a nice clean line. I, I forego that by just using a marking gauge and having the cutter work right up to the marking gauge line. Now, we actually supply fences for them. You don't get the wooden part. And the nice thing about the fence is it gives you extra reference. So when you're using it, you've got, 
you've got you've already referencing your piece with this extra extra bit of fence and then as it gets near the end when it exits instead of swinging around on you you're all you've got reference back here so it helps you stay in line good question thanks for asking that i'll leave it there next but right, actually let me let me uh, let me just uh, introduce angie so angie is ken's cousin and uh angie and her sister lynn they package our t-shirts so when you buy a t-shirt from us like this we have three by the way one says wood is good one says wood doing good and one says wood for good and they are all help promote now these are not these don't this money doesn't go to the purple art project is just merely trying to raise awareness our single biggest problem are finding the combat vets that need our help they tend to isolate themselves. So the more people that know about this, the better chance we have of finding them. And it's a good conversation starter. But when you buy the T-shirt, you'll notice there's a seal on there with an A. Angie has given her seal. They package them up nice and neat like that. They do a wonderful job. And this is Angie working away. What did she do the other day that she was... What had happened that she uh, wasn't going to be able... lost the internet. Oh, she lost the internet. Wasn't going to be able to work. Good thing she got the internet back. Angie's been confined to her bed for a long time, but she is going to get better, and she's coming here and going to work here because we have a, we have a, she has a locker out there waiting for her, and we're working on a bench. Angie and Lynn. Uh, am I, what else did I, oh, yes, I wanted to mention, um, what did I want to mention? Oh, yes. Yeah, so you all, uh, if you haven't, you need to. You need to go back and watch the episode mid-October where we had um, Herman DeMio. And uh, Luther had done, did an incredible job doing a documentary on Herman DeMio. Herman was part of the uh, Tough Hombres. He was Utah Beach D-Day plus four. Plus four? Fought across uh, northern France in the hedgerows was taken captive and spent the last year of the war as a POW. And uh, we had Herman on. Unfortunately, Herman passed just about two months ago. And the DeMio family had, uh, instead of flowers, they had donations sent to the Purple Heart Project. And we received numerous, too many to mention. Thank you, DeMio family. And that will go right back to helping vets. So what better way to, what better way to honor Herman? Fantastic. We actually had him on. I got to talk to him a couple of times. It was, it was, uh, it was a highlight of our Purple Heart Project by, uh, by a long shot. And I, I can't say that without mentioning John. Um, John's last name is down in Florida. Smith. Bob. Sorry, Bob. Bob's Harris. Bob Harris. And Bob's 99, and he's still woodworking. And Bob was a tail gunner in a Liberator and got shot down on his 40th mission while flying over Italy. And he ended up spending a few months as a POW. So, Bob, if you're watching, it was great having you on there as well. And Luther did a documentary on that. You guys got to go back there and watch this. I go back every once in a while and watch it just because it's it was so interesting to see what these guys went through. And it really makes you appreciate the freedom that we have. Um, anything else, Ken? Uh, there was a David Olis. Olaf sent on, said he did some wood shows with you in Surrey, BC. Yeah, David's out in, out in BC. Yeah. And Megan has a list of the vets. Oh, so if you're a combat wounded vet that has been in our class as one of our scholarship vets, we'd love to give you a shout out and recognize you. Say something. Just say, put in the chat, put... At sign, Megan. <laughs> Frick, don't look so, uh, so disgusted. <laughs> you expect me to remember crap like this? I don't know. At sign Megan. You expect me to remember woodworking techniques, so it goes both ways. Hey, you've only been filming for how long? At sign, at the at sign Megan, and then she'll recognize and she'll just, Megan, who do we have? Uh, Doc Bailey. Hi, Doc. He Doc, hold on just one second. Doc Bailey was a, not a medic, a corpsman, Navy corpsman, Vietnam. Told me some stories. They used to get wounded guys... Literally minutes off the battlefield. Uh, Pete. Which Pete? Pete, Pete Ambrose? Ambrose? <laughs> um, Pete Ambrose could quite possibly be one of my favorite of all time vets. He's certainly the best dovetailer we ever had. I have evidence of that. 
Pete was also a Vietnam vet, and Pete lives in uh, um, Alabama. Jake? No. no Mississippi. 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 Uh, looks yeah. like we have Bob, Ebby. Bob. Bob, Bob Abbott? Yeah. Bobert. Bob Abbott is uh, uh, um, Air Force Intelligence? Or is he the one that said, I have nothing to do with intelligence? <laughs> Bob, Bob is... Um, Bob's a good guy. Bob came back and helped us teach. In uh, He was in the class in Ontario, and then he came back here, and he brought another vet with him that came in as a, uh, that's a long story, but we allow any vet that has been to our class gets what's called a blue chip. So if they know of someone that should be here, they are essentially given a, uh, they, they bypass the uh, application process. And Bob came up and uh, spent a week, another week with us. It was great to reunite with him. Robert. Abby. Ebby, Ebby's a great guy. Ebby just moved from EOD. from Utah to uh, Al to uh, Atlanta. Memorial Day. EOD Memorial Day. He he what? Today's EOD Memorial Day. Oh, is it really? I didn't know we had such thing. EOD stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. These are the guys. I, I I can't say that without thinking about Kevin Burris. These are the guys that disarm uh, roadside bombs, any kind of explosive device. And uh, that's not an exact science. So um, high mortality rate among those guys. They, they, riddle, they literally take one for the team. And Ebby uh, is a great guy. Sean, Hi to Ebby and his family. Sean McDermott. Uh, Sean McDermott. So if it was soon to be released is going to be the Sean Shim. Now this device, and I'm telling you right now, I didn't realize it at first. I started using this, and I said to Jake, I said, this is a game changer. This makes the process of offsetting your dovetails almost precise and so much easier than balancing a marking gauge. I didn't think that until I started using it. I said, this is fantastic. This was Sean's idea. So it will be affectionately, affectionately. thank you, known as the Sean Shim. And Sean and his wife, Angela, who is a nurse, live down in Arkansas. I think it's Arkansas. And uh, we've got a special connection. Ray Door. Hope your home teachers found you. Pardon? Ray Door. What, what do you want me here for? Ray Door. Cool, Ray. So, Ray, I, I, uh, as soon as I hear, think of Ray, I think of the uh, mule. And if you haven't, if you don't know what a mule is, Google mule, Vietnam era mule. And it was the funniest looking little tractor, not a tractor, but vehicle that they drove around. And I always see, in my mind, I see Ray coming down the hill while the mine swipe sweepers are going up the hill. <laughs> Where are you guys going? Well, we're sweeping this for mines. <laughs> I just came down. There aren't any. <laughs> Ray, brother, haven't seen you in a while. Hope you're well. Phil. Which Phil? Um, Phil Lawton? It was Phil in Gustafson? 2018 class. Lawrence. Phil Lawrence? Hi, Phil. Haven't been, uh, wonderful to see you, hear you. Um, and then we have a Jerry Gillette. He's a Navy vet. Jerry and Gillette. Do, is he in a class? And then Jerry, appreciate your service. I don't know if you were in one of our classes, and if I'm wrong, please tell me. Um, and then Jack Lane's on, of course. And Jack. I just talked to Jack the other day. Jack, Jack just got back from uh, going, to, he, Jack went down with Chris Chehusky. What? Why are you shaking your head? Shah. Shah Husky. Shah Husky. He's going to change it to make it easier for me to say. And who is with Jack and Chris? Chris Leverkin. And Chris Leverkin and, and um, Vic. Vic. Hash. Hash. So down in, in Texas, they have a, 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 an organization called Operation Comfort. And uh, it's, it's a, a program for vets to get involved in various trades, but Chris and Vic are really head, headlining the, uh, the woodworking part of it. Now, um, Chris came to our class. He was a fuel truck driver that hit, uh, hit, a, hit, a, hit an IED, I believe, or, got, or his fuel truck got hit by an RPG, I can't remember. But either way, he got blown out of the vehicle and lost one of his legs as a result. But uh, you'd never know it the way the guy gets around. 
But he's got his heart in the right place, and Vic, same thing. And they, these guys spend their time trying to help other vets. So I salute you, boys. You're doing a wonderful job. And I know, uh, I know, um, I know how impressed Jack was. So if you impress Jack, you're doing a good job. Anyone else? Not that I'm seeing. Okay. Question, Frick. Uh, Eaton Latini in the chat. Eaton? Yep. Uh, he wants to know your opinion on Clifton Plains. Oh. Uh, can't say something nice. Well, um, Clifton Plains are okay. I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, if you buy one here, shipping uh, heavy tools like that from England over to here is expensive. So I really can't tell you to go out and buy a Clifton plane when you can buy a Lee Nelson. If you're, if you're willing to spend that kind of money, you're better off buying a Lee Nelson. Uh, a Clifton plane is probably going to be close to twice the price of a Wood River. And you're not, re really, you're not gaining anything. The bottom line is, what kind of a surface will the plane produce? And if your plane will leave a surface that you can no longer detect, unlike Moose was able to, an improvement in that surface, then why go any further? And if the Wood River plane will do that for you, hey, you've got extra money that you've saved over the premium plane to go buy another one, like a block plane or a shoulder plane. So I've, I've had a Clifton plane. They actually sent me one to try. And a good plane, but... It doesn't have anything that I would say this is worth spending the extra money to buy. Sorry, Clifton, but that's just the way I'm calling it. Next. All right, Michael Hant. No, sorry. Uh, Kenneth Stewart in Hunter, Kansas. Ken Stewart sounds very familiar. We must know. I think I know Ken. Ken's a builder. A builder? Bench oh, a bench builder. Thank you, Ken. How far out of true on the sole before you would just give up on refurbishing? Well, that's a, really good, that's a really good question because you are limited in your ability to flatten a sole accurately. I tell people, I said, stick to the smoothers. At the most, a jack plane. But you get out to a jointer plane, I'll show you why. Here's a number, here's a number uh, seven. So if I'm flattening the sole of a number seven versus a number four and a half, my two points of pressure are going to be here on the knob and here on the rear tote. So if, you were, if I'm using an abrasive table somehow and I'm working away on this thing, by pushing down here, I'm really covering that sole well. Now, compare that to a number seven. Here's my two points of contact. Look how much surface there is behind my, my pressure point here. You're just not going to be able to do a job that I think is going to be worth the effort on a some number six or a number seven or a number eight that you can do on a smoother or even a jack plane. So um, I don't think I, I did, I, I've lost count, but I know I've prepped more than 300 planes because I used to go to these woodcraft stores and we would teach a class. And uh, what I would do is I would take somebody's plane out of the audience and in that hour long, two hour class, I would go through and do the whole thing. So that means I'm in another, I'm not in my home environment, I'm using other people's equipment, but we were able to go in and always were able to flatten the sole. Never found one on a smoother that we couldn't fix. So I can't imagine one being that far out. And if it is that far out, you probably got yourself a dud. Put it on the shelf and move on. Be my advice. Next. Kevin Burris is on. Hey, Kev. Kevin Burris, salt of the earth. Kevin Burris, EOD, 23 years, I believe. Kevin endured more, more uncontrolled blasts than you can shake a stick at. They've left him uh, um, severely disabled in terms of um, TBIs and all kinds of things. And I asked him one time, I said, Kevin, why didn't you get out of it? Uh, you know, you've had all of these blasts. And he said, he said, well, by the time I got checked out after it would have happened, some of the immediate effect would have subsided. And he said, how could I leave my men without someone that can do the job? So that's the kind of person Kevin is. Super guy. Good friend of Super Dave's. That's how we met him. Kevin, when we were doing wood shows, Kevin would come up. And uh, we'd have him at the Toronto show. There'd be thousands of people there. And he'd be there demonstrating away with uh, Bell, his Bella. 
his um, service dog, and it was just great having him. I miss I miss those times. I hope it comes back. Be good. Say hello to your wife for me. Kevin is six foot three, I think, and his wife is four foot. I think she's four foot six, and if she's four foot seven, I apologize. And they've been in love since uh, I think he met her when he was she was six years old. So they've been childhood sweethearts. Quite a story. Next, Rick. Uh, this one comes from. Yeah, Herman Stanford in New Jersey. Hey, Herman. Like he, that name. He asks, "Is there any real difference between a smooth bottom number seven and a grooved bottom one?" Well, the groove bottom he's talking about is actually called corrugated, and I have one here. So uh, I'll show you the two. So here's a four and a half with a corrugated sole. There's a four and a half with a smooth sole. I personally think it was a gimmick. They claimed that it was uh, less friction, but if you remember back in grade nine physics, it really had nothing to do with it. Um, I can't think of any reason why, with the exception of this. If I had to go in and flatten this sole, it would be easier to flatten the corrugated bottom because you don't have as much metal. Other than that, no reasons. The disadvantage, if you use it to come in and cut a chamfer, well, the corners are always falling into there and they get buggered up as you happen to twist the plane when it's down in there. So uh, I would call it a disadvantage, not an advantage. So absolutely no advantage, no reason to pay any more, and I think it was a gimmick. Next. Uh, just a second, I'm trying to pick one. Norman in New Mexico says, what caution to avoid disappointment do you have in aftermarket chip breakers and blades? Um, well... If you're going to buy an aftermarket blade, I have to be careful here because I have friends that make and sell blades. If you're going to buy an, buy an aftermarket blade, the single biggest advantage is buying a thicker blade. So up until uh, we came out with this one with IBC, aftermarket blades to fit a Stanley or a record plane maxed out at 95 thousandths of an inch. Most were around the 90 mark. So the standard blade is somewhere around 75 thou. And you're buying a replacement blade that is 90 thou. So you're adding 15 thousandths of an inch. Well, 15 thousandths of an inch is what? Four sheets of paper? It really isn't that much. And the reason why is because, I'll explain this. If you take the uh, blade, the chip lever cap off, you see right here, so this is your yoke. The yoke connects to the adjuster knob, and that's how you move your blade forward and back. But the yoke has to pass through the blade in order to get to the chip breaker. Well, if your blade is too thick, the chip, this little short yoke doesn't make it to the chip breaker, you lose that function of advance and retract. So you really couldn't take a blade any thicker than 95 thousandths of an inch. So by going to a replacement blade, you really weren't benefiting from the biggest advantage of, or the biggest advantage gained by a blade is not the metallurgy, it's the thickness, in my opinion. So you're really losing that because going from 75 to 90 is just not that big of a deal. So when I designed this, and I can say I designed this, we actually had a patent pending. What we did, or what I did was, added these two little metal tabs See that? To the underside of the chip breaker. So now you can go to a 140 thou thick blade. Well, when you're going from a 70 or 75 thou thick blade, let me, let me actually take the chip breaker off so you can get a really good look at it. I mean, this thing sounds, feels like tin foil. There's the uh, standard. There's the IBC. Now that's a difference worth paying for. And to compensate for that short yoke, that is the problem by having these two little tabs right there when you put this together they reach down and they meet the yoke so you get all of your adjustment and you get to have the big thick blade now the only modification that you have to be aware of is this 
These, these throats were made for a very thin blade. So on about 65% of the planes, you have to go in and you have to file the mouth to be a little bit wider to in, order, in order to allow the blade to come out. And if your plane is so sacred to you that you don't want to do that, well, then forget it. But remember, this is just a device to hold this to improve this. Don't sweat having to go in and file a little bit. I actually did a YouTube video showing you how to do that. So if you want to go back and look at that, maybe Luther can find it. Ow. And you'll be able to do it. What? Stand here. Stand here? Stand here. You have to put an X on the floor so I know. Next, Rick. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, uh, Jake, do you remember the chap's name that sent us this stuff? Ernie. Ernie? Ernie out in, uh, Ernie, I got your little present. Ernie has a, had a business, he just closed, Grandpa's Little Farm, Vintage Tools. And, uh, he also makes, or he refurbishes braces and bit, braces that we are going to, uh, soon have the uh, pleasure of being able to sell, so... We'll let you know more about that as it comes. But there's the T-shirt. Over more. Oh, oh, sorry. There you go. Thank you, Ernie. And he also sent me a, a couple of files for sharpening auger bits, which I was very appreciative because I find they're very difficult to find. The, that's what these tools are right there. Big thank you. Next, Rick. What is Radar's cat name? Cat's name. Radar had a cat. This question's coming in from Facebook. Oh, wow. Radar's cat. Uh, Babette was his uh, guinea pig. Um, well, I can't remember the name of the racing mouse. But the cat. I can't remember the cat. What was it, Rex? Find out. Go watch about 15 episodes. See if you can come up with it. Rick, Next. You stump me. The promoter of the dead cat doesn't know a cat's name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Daniel. The three-quarter fleece, cozy fleece. That could be it. Dan? Daniel in Culpeper, Virginia. Daniel in Culpeper, Virginia. How do? What are the fatal flaws in an old plane, i.e. cracks or missing parts, that should discourage its purchase? Okay. So the old Stanley planes, and Stanley still makes their planes out of gray iron or cast iron. It's very brittle. If you were to drop a bench plane from the height of a bench onto a concrete floor, there's a good chance you're going to crack or break a piece. If, if the uh, casting itself is cracked, then I'd say, no, don't touch it. Uh, I've seen them welded before, but that heat is going to twist them up. Um, a lot of times I've seen a big chunk of the frog get broken off. So if there's any any damage in terms of a crack or a break on the on the body of the plane or the frog, I would say don't bother with it. Remember, these things are $25 on eBay, so it's not as great a find as a lot of people tend to think. If it's a and if it's a bedrock, if it's a bedrock, you're better off you're better off not touching it. Just having it on your mantle because the minute you start monkeying around with it it loses value from a from a collector's standpoint so um leave it alone yeah all right peter in the uk says hi rob hey, peter if, hi rob if i were to buy a stanley five and a half would it be possible to use a thicker plain iron to stop the vibration and chatter you get with the standard iron if it, if it was possible, would I have to open the throat to accommodate the extra thickness? And if so, how would I open the throat? Okay. Well, we just answered that question. So you just have to back up a little bit. Just remember this, that uh, Stanley, Stanley's five and a half up to 1939 used a, uh, an inch, uh, pardon me, a two, two a, what was it, Jake? Two and a quarter inch blade. And they're very hard to come by. After 39, they went to the 2 and 3 eighths inch blade, which is common. So 4 and a half, 5 and a half, 6 and 7 all use a 2 and 3 eighths inch wide blade. If you're pre-39, it's a 2 and a quarter inch blade, and you're probably not going to be able to find a replacement blade for it. Um, how do you open up the throat? It's really not hard. We did a video on it, and you can go check that out, but I'll show you just briefly. So if you take your plain body... Strip it down, meaning 
You can take the frog out if you want, but you don't need to. So I would put that in a vise. Actually, you gotta put it like this because you're gonna open up the forward. You, you don't have to do anything to the rear. It's only the forward uh, part that you're gonna work with. The best thing to do is to get a Sharpie and go in there and paint, paint this surface. Okay, you paint that surface, now you know where you're working. What you want is you want to keep that surface right there that I painted square to this, to the sole of the plane. So when you're filing, you don't want to file at an angle in either direction. You want to keep it square. And what you're going to do is you're going to file from one side to the other. Um, what ends up happening is people often get a smiley face in there. So to avoid that, my first stroke I'm going to actually be twisting my file like this to put a little more pressure in here in this corner. And then I'll always keep it moving left to right or right to left. And then I'll come over here and do the same thing. And by moving left to right, you don't end up coming, cutting a divot in there. And you're just going to work that. If you're not sure, you go back in and paint it again. But don't go too far before you stop. Put the blade in and check it. If it, if it fits... Stop when you need to. Don't go too far. Is that the one I had in here, Jake? It wasn't. It was this one. You also have to wind down, uh, bring this back some too as well in order to get space. But it's really not hard. Like I said, I went through and I did a YouTube video on how to do it. Don't sweat it. The only bit of advice I tell you is just go a little bit at a time. Don't go hog wild. Do a little check. Do a little check. You'll eventually get it. You don't want it to be super tight because you have some movement. So by the way, when you do that, evaluate it with the frog pulled back as far as you can. Not as far as you can, but as far as you can without having the blade come up off of the frog. So if you bring your frog back too far, can you hone in on this, Jake? You see how there's two feet on this frog? And you've got that piece in the middle? If you bring the frog back too far, that piece in the middle is going to sit up above here. And now your blade's going to be sitting like that. So what you need is to have it pulled back to a point where this is not sitting above this surface. At that point, you want to put your blade in and check it. And when you get it so that it's just getting an opening, then you can decide, okay, how much extra room do I want? And if you need to, you can take off a little bit more. Really, it's not hard. Get yourself a brand new file. Don't work with some old thing that your grandfather left you. Files are not meant to last forever. And it doesn't, they don't cost a lot, but get a nice sharp file. It's so much easier to work with. Next, Rick. Uh, so how's, our, how's our time? Uh, <coughs> 15 minutes. Okay, remember to register for our draw. Does, uh, where'd Megan go? Do we know where we are in terms of how many? Okay, somebody will figure it out. See how much, how many prizes we're giving away tonight. All right, Kevin James in Hi, Kevin. the UK. Wow, says, a lot of UKers. Yeah. Many older planes, I find, don't have the sides square to the sole. What do you recommend is the best way to correct this? Can you want to answer that? I didn't hear the question. I was reading the feed. Oh. <laughs> Many older planes, I find, don't have sides square to the sole. What do you recommend is the best way to correct it? Oh. Disc, a disc sander. Yeah. Get a big, big old disc sander. First of all, only you only worry about this if that's the plane that you shoot with. That's the only plane you're ever going to use on its side. And if you want to get even lazier, you only need to square one side. If you're right-handed or left-handed, that's the side of the plane that you need square. How are you going to do it? We do it in here, but we have a setup where we use a big old disc sander, and we run the plane forth and back, and we check it. How would you do it by hand? That's tough. Yeah. You could uh, come over here. We just bought some of this today. This just came in today or yesterday. Porter Cable makes a um, makes sandpaper with an, a, a, a sticky back. Comes in a roll like that. And what I would do, if you have some kind of a reference surface, I've got a big old granite plate. that I know is flat. So you can stretch out a roll of that. Then I would take something substantial 
and I would clamp it. Let's pretend that this is square. I would clamp that onto that block. So now I've got a piece of sandpaper here. I've got that block on there. Sorry, I should have grabbed that with me. Give me a second. I'll take, I'll use my uh, number six, which would be a good plane to use on a shooting board. Now, what you're going to want to do, depending on which side, you're going to reference, this has got to be held firmly, you've got to reference the sole up against this, and then you're going to run that forward and back until you eventually bring that to being square. And it's actually not as hard as you think. Cast iron is pretty soft, and it'll, it'll uh, wear away rather quickly. Use some compressed air to keep this clean because the sandpaper gets clogged up and it stops cutting. And you got to make sure that you're keeping that flat against there. So I'd want to have this clamped well enough that I could push firmly against there, keeping that sole flat on that side and, and being able to work that back. Or I suppose you could even do it like this. However, this isn't the reference surface. But if you could have somehow set it up with a reference surface like that with the sandpaper, you could run it forward and back. Or buy a plane that's already square. Remember, only if you're using it on a shooting board. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Okay, next. Megan, do you, can you figure, figure where we are in terms of donations so we know how many? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Okay. Uh, Bob W., Hi, Bob. W, yeah. where? Yeah. Uh, Spring, Texas. Where? Spring, Texas. Spring, Texas. Bob and Spring. Other than sentimental value, can a refurnished plane perform as well as current technology? Pros and cons. Please. Yes. Yes, they can. Uh, what they're missing, the, the best plane that I've refurbished and, and got to work well, they're missing that, that uh, solid ring or feeling that you get off of a plane what do, remember, Jake, when we weighed the five and a half Stanley versus the five and a half Wood River? Do you remember what the difference was? It, it was a pound and a bit. Yeah, it wasn't a little. So you're talking about a plane that weighs six and a half pounds, and the Wood River was more than a pound heavier than the old Stanley. So what what would be one pound out of seven? Fifteen uh, percent. Yeah, actually, it would be closer to twenty percent. Because it was more than a pound, it was about a pound and a half. So ten uh, percent would be seven point seven. So twenty percent would be one point four. So but a pound and a half. So about twenty percent increase in weight. And th what that results in is this solid feel. I can't really explain that. That's like trying to tell somebody what salt tastes like. But if you run a if you run a sharp plane over a piece of wood and it is made out of a dense material like ductile iron and it's flat and heavy, you just you just have this feedback that is, wow, this is just rock solid. The Stanleys never had that. They didn't have anything to compete against, so they didn't have to. But now that planes are being made with denser material and a beefier casting, I think it's really worth it. So can you make an old Stanley work as well? You can certainly, certainly make it cut, because that's in the blade, as long as the blade is held solid or held firmly. You don't have the same level of adjustment. It's not as fine. And that, that's not a huge deal. But I always try to, you know, get rid of all the little irritants. Make it so that it's a pleasurable experience every time you pick up that plane. So, yes, you can. You're going to spend some money. You're not, you definitely can't make it perform as well with the standard blade. No way. It'll cut, but not like it, not like it will with an enhanced blade. If you bought a, an IBC blade chip breaker set, it's $100. The hundred dollars. So cost of your plane, the hundred dollars for the blade and chip breaker, and the time you're going to spend. I would seriously look at a Wood River five and a half or a six, and say, okay, how much is my time worth? And end result, which is going to be better. Don't forget your plane adjust star makes a huge difference. Next, Rick. Next question comes from Chris Goodwin in Santa Clara, Utah. Hey, Chris. He says, Santa Clara. Where's Santa Clara, Saint Megan? St. George. Is it down by St. George? I Megan, live, Megan is from Kanosh. Kanosh. So if you threw a dart at the state of Utah and you got it right in the middle, you'd hit Kanosh. Uh, now I lost the question. Uh, can you explain the positioning of the frog and the iron? K 
Can I explain the position of the frog and the iron? Positioning of the frog and iron. Maybe where it's supposed to be. I don't know. Jake, do you know? I'm 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 uh, I'm not quite Yeah. You need, if hopefully you'll have time. You need to ask that question again cuz I'm not quite picking up on on what you mean about the positioning and the uh, the, bla the blade and the frog. Okay, Bill K in Sacramento, California. Hi, Bill. Want you or uh, says how do you prepare the chip breaker on an old plane? Get rid of it and buy a new one. <laughs> well, it's it's just hard and here's why it's hard. Where's the chip? Here's the chip breaker. Make sure you take this. Don't lose it. Make sure you take the screw off. So you you want to use a diamond plate to do this because it t it takes a fair bit of work. I'd flip that over. Now you've got to have the bottom sitting lower than here because this has to be a negative angle. So what we used to do, you'd put it on the back of your blade and you check it and you see where it's high. So if I put it on the back of this blade. And I looked up at the light. Oh my goodness. Okay, you, you, can you uh, see that? Do you see that and tell me if you... Look at it straight on, I'll be able to see it. Yeah. Would you want to have to work on that? Now, it's going to change a little bit when you push down on it, but still, there's all kinds of light in there. So you got to say, okay, well, I'm high on this side. So I would go in here... And I would put my finger down on there. Now, I would have this set up so that it was positioned properly. And you may have to elevate this a little bit, whatever. You can't go in very far. You're also going to bump in here. So I would hold my finger right there if that was the offending high spot. Hold your, pla hold your, your uh, stone in place. And you would go in, because this little thin metal will flex under the weight of your finger. Put it back on and check it. Mm, a little bit more. And you'd go in and you'd do that again. And you would just essentially move your finger to the offending spot and little tiny circles so that you're not going too far that way. And you would just have to keep going through until you finally get that right. And as a final thing, I would go in and I would just kind of roll that to clean up that backside. So you want it relatively sharp right there. You want, you want this to meet the blade so that it's definitely a negative angle underneath here and there's no gap out there. It's a, I wouldn't say it's a lot of work, but it's certainly more work than what it's worth. I would buy a new chip breaker and you can buy them. In fact, we just got a bunch in, didn't we? Ken said we did. Didn't we just get chip breakers? We got uh, blades. We didn't get chip breakers. No, I thought we saw a bunch of them. No chip breakers yet. We're getting some. Next question. All right. Our final question of the evening comes from Al Dunn. How come it's the final question? Because it's 5-2. We have a draw to do. Yeah, but five, that, that's... We it takes you five that. minutes to no. answer a question. At yeah. least. Yeah. Al Dunlop is asking, Rob, do you ever envision planes evolving, evolving any more than they have already, or do you think they've come as far as they're ever ah. going to come? Al, where have you been, brother? Evolving? We're all about evolving. Is this not the evolution of the hand plane? The adjustar? Magic plane wax? Yeah, but that's not... The super duper adjustment screwdriver? I know, it was only one of them. Yeah, they, they're evolving in this sense, Al. You got better blades, thicker blades. That adjustar is really a game changer. If you're over 55 and you've got any kind of issues with your hands, you'll you have to get one of those because it makes it doable. The material... This is ductile. This is gray iron. Drops it breaks. This is ductile iron, essentially unbreakable. This, you, it was a crapshoot as to whether or not it was going to remain flat. This is stress relief before they grind it. Um, I think David Charlesworth's back bevel is uh, is evolution of hand planes. It cuts sharpening down. David Charlesworth's back bevel made sharpening freehand and prep. Of, uh, it's something anybody, any novice can do and do it with precision and expertise. So as far as the actual function of the plane, eh, I think there's a little bit of romance with this that you, you really want it to change. I, I, Ken, tell me how much you love running after you. So can we, Ken now does a lot of the prep work on the planes. 
So the last thing you get to do after you've gone through and turned this all up is you sharpen it up, you wax it, and you run over a piece of wood. Is that almost reward for what you just did? It is. So we really don't have to pay you anymore because no, just not for that time. No. <laughs> running a plan. Uh, it's probably the most relaxing, stress-reducing thing that I do in the shop. In fact, when we teach the vets, the first thing we do on Monday morning is we teach them how to sharpen and use a hand plane. And by noon, when everybody's got it and they're planing wood, nobody's talking, you just hear this whisper of, of a plane running over a board and a shaving coming out, and you just feel the tension in the room just dissipate. It's pretty incredible. This is probably the best stress reliever out there. And if you know anybody that's stressed out, introduce them to a sharp hand plane. Just let them try it. I love bringing people in and just handing a plane to them. Say, here, just try this. The average person has, the above average person, has never had a chance to use a properly tuned and sharpened plane. And when they do, they get giddy. It's, it's an experience to be had. Wrap it up. How many people do we have on tonight? 881. 881. Folks, big shout out to all our vets. And, oh, let me give you a quick update. So we were planning a class for civilians and combat wounded vets in the four Atlantic provinces, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, PEI. If you don't know your geography, Google it. And the, those four provinces were going to have what was called the Atlantic bubble, where you could unrestricted travel between them. Well, we thought, okay, well, great. At least we can bring those people in. So we planned it. And then we had some serious outbreaks. New Nova Scotia has got the worst outbreak they've had in the entire COVID time. So they've closed their province to at least three more weeks, which is going to make it impossible for us to do the class. Uh, we're, going to bump, we're going to try it for June. Hopefully things will clear up and we'll be able to do it in June. So we haven't made the official announcement yet, but if you were part of or thinking about the class, or if you're one of our combat wounded vets that has applied, we've had to bump it out a month. Sorry. We can't do anything about it. We can't get you into the province. We can't very well do a class. But we are trying, and we will get it. We will conquer. Moose, anything to say? PatSecretGarden.com. Get yourself a dead cat. You'll love it. I, I asked you, and then I said it. <laughs> you said it. Ken, anything? Big shout-out to Harold. Harold, get better soon. Junior? Hurry up, come back. He doesn't watch anyway, but he was here today. Um, Chris, Chris Davenport, if you're watching, you are a big reason why we're selling a lot of saws, so keep it up, brother. Appreciate it. In fact, I was going to invite you down next time we do this. I meant to say to Jake today, I said, why don't we invite Chris down? So come down and have dinner with us. Megan, any more vets to say hello to? Not that I've seen. I'll go through and read the comments and Okay, Frick. All right, we ready? How many well no, we don't know how 45. many. Forty five. Forty five hundred? Mm -hmm. So we're giving away We had two two very generous donations. Well a lot of very generous donations. Okay, so we're giving away so thank you. three three um, block planes. Oh Santa Claus. I, I haven't I heard from Santa Claus a week and a half ago. He's on the mend from COVID. We are, uh, we're thinking about you, you and Mrs. Claus. He is getting better. He's on the, uh, he's on the uh, uphill side, so um, our prayers are with you. Hopefully everything works out for the best. Um, we are giving away three. We'll do a draw for three low-angle block planes and the uh, big prize, which is the number six, that will be all done up. And we're drawing for three dead cats, so let's start off with the dead cats. Are you ready for it? I am. Your chances of winning this evening are 1 in 701. And let's First go. dead cat. Remember, if you win a dead cat, you need to contact us and let us know what size. Small, medium, large, extra large, double extra large, and triple extra large. All right, here we go. First dead cat winner is Adam Fawcett in Kentucky. Congratulations, Adam. I always love Kentucky. Number two is Matt Olson in Texas. Matt, congratulations. What part of Texas does it say? No, no. And our third and final dead cat is Dean Albin in Elkville, Illinois. Hey, Dean, congratulations to all three Americans. 
That's the first time. And what's next? Next is a uh, low, uh, Wood River Low Angle Block that will be sharpened by Ken. Winner of that is Simple. He just put his name as Ruzi. Oh, that's friggin' Loren. <laughs> it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it doesn't count. No, Disqual- she gets it. <clears throat> Disqualified. So Loren is my daughter in Calgary. Oh, just And if you order Wait. from us the first time, I call you. Second, third, fourth, and hundredth time, Loren will call you. So congratulations, Rue. You didn't win. Only because I know you won't use it. Employees aren't allowed to win. Yeah, and your employee, that's right. She's on the payroll. <laughs> All right. So the real winner is Bill Bishop in Sour Lake, Texas. Hey, Bill. A lot of stuff going to Texas. Congratulations. And final? No. <clears throat> you got two more two more uh, low angle blocks to give away and then the number six. Elian Stewart in Alberta. Elian. Ellie and Stewart. I think it's two different people. Ellie and Stewart. You have to fight over it, but congratulations. I'm only sending you one plane. All right. Final. My brother Randy lives in uh, in Lacombe, which is in Alberta. And my daughters Loren, Annika, Carissa, and my grandson Beckham. Beckham live in Calgary. And my sister Christy lives in Sherwood Park. So I got a good chunk of the Cosman family in Alberta. All right, what's this? My mother watching tonight? Hi, Mom. No. She had better things to do. (laughs) (laughs) So did we all. Um, What is this for? Is this for the number six? No. Did we give away three low angle blocks? This is number two then. No, this is number three. We're sending one to Texas, one to Alberta. Cody O in Moser, Pennsylvania. Hey, Cody. Congratulations. Now? Now for the number six. Grand prize winner tonight is Aaron Addison in Illinois. Hey, Aaron. Congratulations. You'll love it. Number six is the one that we give to the vets. That's the one they take home. It works exceptionally well on the shooting board with that little extra length and mass. It, uh, it'll perform well. You'll be impressed. And it'll come square sides, all done up, as if it came right off of my bench. Okay. Thank you to Frick behind the... Uh, actually, Frick, was a, it was almost a glitch-free night. We only lost video once, right? Yeah, it was Jake's fault. Though, so. Jake's fault? My mic died. His mic died. So Frick, and right behind Frick is my oldest grandson, Bentley. You want to get Bentley on the camera? I, we got him he's in there. We got him oh, in the, the, oh, he's in the Frick cam? The Frick cam. And yeah. Bentley wants to, be a, wants to grow up to be a woodworker, right, Bentley? Yeah. Who's your favorite woodworker of all time? Not you. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't name another one. Cruel. Though. Thank you There's to Megan. Know anyone else, but you're still not his favorite. <laughs> Any announcements yet? No. 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 Thank you to Megan for taking care of uh, keeping track of our donations and also the vets. And you vets, you need to put it out there. We need to say hi to you. Thank you for Jake being on the camera and wearing his apparatus. Thank you for Ken for being here to be a gopher for me tonight. And thank you to Moose for coming and supporting our program. Thank you to my daughter Erica and my, and my mother-in-law. Elner, who made supper for us tonight. It was excellent. Thank you, my good wife. I made the burgers. And who? I made the burgers. And Frick made the burgers. Were they good? The burgers were good. What? Thank you to Rex, who was here somewhere. Pardon? Oh, they email support at Rob Cosby. Thank you to Luther. He works hard. Paid you today. Thank you to Super Dave. Um... You must be forgetting someone. <laughs> yeah. If I am, shame on me. Yeah. Next anyway. week we'll have Super Dave teach us how not to plow. How not to plow? Yeah. Super Dave's sister was with us today. Oh, was she? Yeah. Up in Alaska? Or is she in New York? Is she in Alaska? No, it's... it's Super his... Dave's mom is moving down to New York. All right, folks, we will see you in two weeks. I think we're going to... In two weeks we're going to do another question and answer. That seems to be popular. You can ask whatever you want. I really enjoyed this one tonight. Get out and plane. Love it. And if you need sharpening equipment, we've got a good supply. We just had a huge shipment arrive, so we've got everything that you need. Don't forget, your if you're restoring old planes, that works like magic. It's, it really is great. Your, your uh, 
that'll make it so much easier. And it's also a stubby, fits well in your pocket, your adjuster, and your plain wax. And a big thank you to Kevin for introducing us to that, the chap who makes it. All right, guys, enjoy your next two weeks. We will see you shortly.